Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Actively Passive Investing Show. I am your host, Travis Watts. As always, I appreciate you guys so much for being here. I have a very exciting episode to share with you here today. And what we're talking about is how to live a balanced life, and specifically from the perspective of being an investor, whether you're an active investor or a passive investor like I am, I just wanna talk about finding and creating a little bit of balance and how that plays into investing. So you've probably heard the term work-life balance in one form or another at one time or another. And it's kind of what we're talking about, but there, there's a bigger picture here that I want to address. There's something very profound, a very simple message that I want to share with you in today's episode. So with that in mind, I want you guys to think about uh, this really quick. You know, it's, it's tough to be rich, let's say, but be in poor health and to live the good life. Equally so, you could be in great health and great physical shape, but if you're living at or below the poverty line or piled up in debt, it's also tough to live the good life. And even if you have the health and the wealth under control, but you're in, let's say, a terrible relationship that is dragging you down and making you depressed, it's also tough to live the good life. So I want to help you guys with balancing these different aspects and just talk about a few things. Now, I'm no you know, coach or guru or, or expert here, and I'm, I'm not pretending to be, but I do want to share some things I think are impactful and insightful with you. So let's kick off this episode with a visual exercise real quick. What comes to mind visually in your mind when I say the words financial freedom? I'll give you a minute here to think about it. Financial freedom, financial independence, not having the obligation to have to work. Okay, it's a, it's a work optional lifestyle. What would you do with your time? What does financial freedom mean? Now, whatever you're picturing in your mind, the first thing I want to address is resistance. I think there's a true benefit to having some resistance in your life, something to push against. Uh, a couple years back, Joe Fairless at the Best Ever Conference, I can't remember if it was the 2019 or 2020, best ever conference that happens every year out in Denver or in Keystone in, in this case, he was talking about having a thorn in your side, something that's kind of irritating, that, that agitates you, that makes you want to take action, right? You want to address it. You want to stay active and move forward and push through it and fix the problem. So it's good sometimes to have a thorn or a pain point, so to speak. Think of it like this. You might have visioned when I asked you about financial freedom, sitting on the beach and, and drinking pina coladas or hanging out on a yacht and popping champagne. And while those things can be fun for a period of time, they're really not sustainable and they're certainly not gonna be fulfilling to you long-term. As, as appealing as that might be for a weekend or, or even up to one week, I think we would all get pretty bored and become uh, obese alcoholics over time if, if, if that's all that we we did with our, our spare time. So a practical example in real life is think about Bill Gates, right? He ran as a CEO and then as, as the chair of Microsoft, and this is what he did actively. But as he realized <laughs> a little late in the game, as he realized he had more than enough wealth, he stepped down from being active on the job and he started being active in charity. He runs a really huge foundation. And so he's still active and moving forward and using his brain and applying value to the world, just not in a work sense, right? He's not at a cubicle nine to five, how to you know punch his time in and out. He's still producing, but in a different way. And that's what I wanna have you guys think about for yourselves. Interesting little side note too, before this, this episode, I was just reading, there's a lot of research out there, believe it or not, of children that come from upper middle class to wealthy lifestyles that are handed a lot of things, uh, the anxiety, the depression, the substance abuse, statistics shoot through the roof. I mean, you might be surprised to, to learn that, but basically at the end of the day, what it comes down to is that there was nothing uh, as far as resistance, there was nothing to 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 push against or uh, to achieve. You know, there's a lot of fulfillment in setting a goal and then going out there and and grinding it out and then achieving that goal and then feeling that that success and that dopamine rush. But if it's all just handed to you as an end result, you can easily take that for granted. There's a great article written by the way on uh, APA.org, American Psychological Association. I want to say, don't don't quote me on that. But it was by uh, Sonia. 
Christina Luther, PhD. She's a professor of psychology, and it was about what we're talking about here. And the only point that, that I'm really trying to make with any of this is that you, you do need, in my opinion, some resistance and something to push again to, to help you move forward. So be thinking about that. I think a lot of people get fearful of retirement because you hear these, these scary things like, you know, once you stop working, you start dying or whatever. It's all about figuring out what it is you're going to do and having a plan. So it's something to start thinking about sooner than later. And hopefully uh, you, you can be in a position as an investor to uh, retire early if you wish to do so, or at least move to some part-time work to free up time to do other things that are meaningful to you. As I always say, the goal of investing for passive income is to do less of the things you don't enjoy and to focus more on the things that you love, quite simply put. So some resistance is good, not all resistance all the time. You got to find a balance there. So let's transition into talking about a few things in regard to health. So quite frankly, there's a lot of marketing and sales crap out there in the health space. But let me make health simple for you. It comes down to just diet and exercise. That's it. Simply put, it doesn't have to get all fancy with this keto and vegan and vegetarian and paleo and all this fancy crap. Look, you and I both know what healthy food is compared to unhealthy food. The bottom line is just pay attention to what you're putting in your body, avoid fried foods and processed things as much as possible, and drink lots of water and eat more greens. That's really it. You do you, you figure out you know the, the, the specifics of what works best with your body, but generally speaking, just avoid the nonsense. Now, as far as exercise goes, again, no specific routines or there isn't just this one trick of the trade, but for anybody who's traveled outside the United States, what you may have discovered is exercise is actually a free thing. You know, you can actually go on a walk or a jog or a run and it's free. You don't need a treadmill in your house or these fancy Peloton bikes. You know, you can get a bicycle for 25 bucks in a Craigslist or a garage sale if you need to, or a pull-up bar for 20 bucks on Amazon. You can do push-ups at home. You can do sit-ups at home. Everything that you need in terms of exercise truly is free. But again, we live in a capitalistic society, so we get sold on a lot of things, and we think it needs thousands and thousands of dollars of equipment and fancy gyms and orange theory classes and all this kind of stuff. And there's nothing inherently wrong with any of that if it helps you or if you enjoy it. Generally, get your heart rate up and exercise, eat better foods and less processed foods. That's really it. There's a great quote that I, I heard years ago that's, it doesn't matter what you do 10% of the time. What matters is what you do 90% of the time. That makes all the difference. So you can go eat cake and ice cream and french fries and processed foods and drink alcohol and do all these things, but try to limit it to 10% of what you do. And the rest of the time, try to eat right, try to exercise, try to do the right thing. Simple, but not easy, as I like to say. Now let's transition to finances and wealth. My simple take is this, invest in assets that produce passive income and use that passive income to provide yourself with more options in life or to enhance your lifestyle. It's whatever you wanna do with it, okay? But the bottom line is invest in assets that produce passive income or dividends or cash flow or interest or royalties. There needs to be an income stream that is being paid out to you. That is the name of the game. That is my mission. That is my message. That is what I live and breathe. That is what I teach. These assets can be active or passive. I'm not saying everyone has to be a passive investor or do what I do. I'm saying if you're going to be an active investor, focus on cash flow and passive income. Don't focus as much on speculation and trying to time the market and trying to say, I'm going to buy this property today at this price and fix it up. And I think I'm going to sell it for X and down the road because you never know. The Fed comes in, they change interest rates, the whole environment changes. We have a, a, a new virus that comes out. It could all just screw up your entire plan. So my best advice is focus on passive income. When you focus on the buy low and sell high mentality, I covered this in fact in, in a few episodes ago, so go check it out if you haven't. It's called The Lost Decade, How to Avoid 0% Returns. And it's how you could potentially get hosed, <laughs> so to speak, when you're doing buy low, sell high and trying to speculate. There's like a thousand ways you could get hosed, but the main thing is it really happened in real life in a big, big way. And it was about people who invested with their IRAs, brokerage accounts and cash in 
just index funds in general, just the overall stock market, not really paying attention to cash flow or dividends and just saying, you know, I just want to participate. And then, you know, your, your account trickles up, it trickles down, it trickles up, it trickles down. And from January 2000 to December 2009, you basically made zero dollars and zero cents. So check out that episode for more. And the last thing that I want to say about wealth is try not to get caught up in what I call the success cycle. And again, I made an episode on it and I also wrote a very lengthy blog on this. And it's this concept of you make a million bucks and then once you get to the destination, you go, well, I, I, I need $2 million. And then when you get to 2 million, you go, mm, I, you know, 4 million is kind of what I need. And then you get to 4 million and now you need 8 million. And, and, and the point is you're going to work till the day you die. You don't know how much is enough. You don't know why you're doing what you're doing in most cases. And another phrase for this could be keeping up with the Joneses. If you're comparing yourself to others and saying, I'm not rich enough. I don't have enough. I need two homes, three homes. I need five cars. I need the boat. I need the plane. I need the, it never freaking ends. So don't don't get caught up in that. Truly reflect on what matters to you, what brings you the most happiness in life. Focus on those things and know how much is enough. There was an episode here on the Actively Passive show in August, I believe, of 2020, and it's called uh, How Do You Know How Much Is Enough? Something like that. So go check out that episode if you haven't already. And listen, you guys, the, the simple math is this. The simple point is this. The average U.S. income I believe is still around, I don't know, 50 to 60,000 per year or something like that per individual. So a million bucks invested at 8% a year is $80,000 per year. So quite frankly, most Americans would be A-OK -okay and happy with a million bucks. And that's it. That's, that's enough. Okay. If you're the person grinding it out for 50K a year and you could have 80K a year that's tax advantaged, that's almost, you know, double your income at this point. That's more than enough for a lot of people. So maybe you don't have to be someone with, you know, $100 million to be happy. Maybe 1 million would suffice. So know your number and know how much is enough and just think about it in terms of being an investor. All right, the last category I wanna talk about is just relationships in general. We're talking about friends, family, colleagues, spouses, kids, the whole deal. And listen, again, I'm no expert in this area. I'm not pretending to be, I wanna be as candid and, and, and humble as I can with you guys. And especially in this category, <laughs> I've struggled a lot with finding balance in this area. I mentioned when I worked 100 hours a week away from home, that was one extreme where I had no balance whatsoever. And then I transitioned out of that and I met my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time. And when we started dating, I lost connection with a lot of my my friends and things because I was spending so much time with her. And then, you know, later I tried to bring the friends back in with with my spouse, but then I lost touch with with uh, some of my family members. So it's been an ongoing struggle and an ongoing battle for me. But there's a few things I've learned, a few takeaways that I think you might find useful. Rule number one, at least for myself, has been don't be overly independent thinking I can do it all on my own. I don't need anybody else in my life, but also don't be overly reliant on other people. If you're not being a social butterfly seven days a week, then you're depressed. It, 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 it has to be the balance somewhere in between. You do need people in your life or it's a pretty lonely existence, but the hard truth is that people will let you down here and there. So you, you can't be too, you can't hold your expectations too high, let's say. And number two rule for at least myself, not giving advice to anybody else, but just sharing in case this is helpful, is you shouldn't always get your way. I think it's nice to have a healthy balance there. I think it's what's led to a fantastic marriage so far with my wife is that we both are able to voice our opinion and rationalize together, but we trade off on who wins kind of what battle, so to speak, and there's no hard feelings. It's just trying to find that balance. You pick out the colors for that room and I'll pick out, uh, I don't know, the, the the flooring and the ceiling fan or the artwork on the wall. And, and we, we try to work together. It's not just, nope, you know, it's my house, my rules, this is how things go, because that, that really puts uh, a big crunch in things. 
So be okay with not always getting your way. It's also nice in the workplace. It's also nice in terms of investing, right? You're not always, things aren't always gonna go as planned and I think that's a good lesson. I, I've invested in stocks, for example, that I thought, oh my gosh, they just fell 30%. I'm getting a bargain. I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy in. Well, and then they, they fell another 30%. <laughs> and I was stuck holding the bag and that's okay because it teaches you lessons that well, maybe there's a lot of volatility in the stock market. And if you can't stomach that or you're not okay with it, that may not be a great investment for you. I don't know. And the last thing I want to point out, rule number three is diversify who you spend your time with. So for example, I spend some time with my mentors and I have quite a few and mentors help, you know, pull me up and guide me towards where I want to be in terms of my goals. I also spend some time with my peers and with colleagues and with my spouse and with my family and with my friends. And, and that's nice too. And it has its own benefits. And then I spend some time educating others that are trying to get on the path that I or other people like me are on and trying to educate and inspire. And it's why I do this show. And so again, thank you guys so much for listening, but this is part of how I spend my time and diversify it up. And you guys, the perspective is the biggest benefit here. You get a ton of perspective and gratitude and fulfillment, at least I do, from diversifying out. I don't think it's that healthy personally, to spend all your time with any one person or one sector or one group. I think you can get very biased and uh, have black and white thinking and just miss out on a lot of learning opportunities. So with all of that, I guess my final thoughts to conclude this episode would be that unfortunately, I suppose, there isn't just one thing that makes us happy or fulfilled. It's a combination of all the categories that we discussed. And of course, we could probably talk for several more hours on these topics and we could probably add a lot more collaboratively to the conversation, but hopefully that helps. And it's a few uh, practical takeaways or tips. So I wish you and your family the best of luck on your journey. Always happy to be a resource for anybody here listening. If you have any questions, reach out. Travis at ashcroftcapital.com, joefairless.com. I'm on LinkedIn, social media, Instagram, et cetera. So thank you guys for the feedback, for the comments, and have a best ever week, everybody. We will see you next time on the Actively Passive Investing Show. Thank you.